state trading enterprises, are they really a barrier for agriculture? Before explaining how I go about answering that question, I want to just outline a little bit the importance of agri-food exports to Australia's merchandise trade, and to say something about non-tariff measures in general, and then I'll explain specifically how I want to answer this question, and then use the Indonesian rice market as an example, as a case study of the way in which we can try and answer the question. Exports of agri-food products are important, are worth about 46 billion over the period 2014-15 to 2016-17, and represent about 18% of merchandise exports. That is, that's goods, not goods and services. This is a slide of the, of the commodity shares for, the, for that period, and we can, we can see that total meat and livestock products represented 28%, Grains represented 19%, so together they represent about half of Australia's agricultural exports or agri-food exports. In terms of the destinations to which these exports go, the large grey slice of the pie is, uh, is North Asia, and the yellow slice to the side of it is Southeast Asia. So between the two, we've got roughly 60% of agri-food exports going to these two regions, with the other regions being clearly much less important. Many of the markets to which these commodities go face tariffs and non-tariff measures, even where the trade is going to countries which are part of various preferential trade agreements. Last year, the Commonwealth Government's foreign policy white paper acknowledged that agri-food exports are important as the slide demonstrates. They also noted that non-tariff measures inhibit the growth or may inhibit the growth of these exports. But at the same time, the government recognized that non-tariff measures can be legitimate policy instruments, but on the other hand, they may not be. And one of the things that I want to do is to explore the issue of state trading enterprises as a non-tariff measure and identify the conditions under which a state trading enterprise in a sense, is not legitimate in that it distorts trade and identify those situations in which it is legitimate and may well enhance trade. In the white paper, the government announced its determination to ensure that non-tariff measures do not restrict expansion of Australia's agri-food exports. So what are non-tariff measures. The definition that uh, you find in textbooks is totally useless. <laughs> in the sense that it's, it's a negative definition or a residual definition. It's a policy measure which may act at the border or it may act behind the border. And when it acts behind the border, it may nevertheless affect international trade flows because it may affect domestic production or domestic consumption or both. So in that sense, it affects international trade flows, but in ways which I'll explain in a moment are rather opaque. Because of the opacity of this, of this definition and because the list of non-tariff measures is hugely extensive, one of the, there was a, a project which was coordinated by the WTO and, and UNCTAD called the MAST project, which tried to make sense of non-tariff measures. So they cr created a, a t classification scheme, which uh, has 16 chapters of which 15 refer to imports and only one to exports. And just to give some examples of their classification scheme, Chapter A is SPS measures, that is sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and these may be product or process standards or lots of other examples. Then there are technical barriers to trade, for example, labeling. So the SPS measures come under the WTO agreement on SPS, the TBT measures come under the WTO agreement on TBT, 
So there are rules there which governments are supposed to abide by. They don't always do so, but they can then be challenged. Then there are quantity control measures such as tariff quotas. There are anti-dumping, or sorry, anti-competitive measures such as state trading enterprises, and that's what I want to focus on and to show that anti-competitiveness is not really the, the, the correct category into which S state trading enterprises should be placed. Category O, intellectual property measures, for example, geographical indications, which we're going to, going to hear about from, from the next speaker, and then intellectual property, sorry, rule, rules of origin, okay. which are important in preferential trade agreements. So, if we were to study NTMs, non-tariff measures, commodity by commodity and country by country, then we can identify their incidence. In, in other words, on what commodities do they occur, in which countries do they occur. And when we do that, we find the SPS, TBT, and state trading enterprises for agri-food commodities are the most important ones. Knowing the incidence of NTMs doesn't actually identify their trade effects. We would want to know more than for country X and commodity Y, there is a non-tariff measure in place. We want to know what is the trade effect of that measure for that particular commodity in that particular importing region. Turns out that trying to measure the trade effects of NTMs is difficult because they often lack transparency. They may be transparent to the government that puts them in place, but they may not be so transparent to firms that are trying to export to that country. And the other difficulty is there is a huge diversity of NTMs across countries and across commodities. Ideally, it would be nice to, to be able to measure the ad valorem tariff equivalent, because then we would have a single number which would give us a sense of to what extent this particular NTM is inhibiting trade, because we, we would have, say, its trade effect is equivalent to a 20% tariff then we, could, we would then have a sense of its trade effect. But unfortunately, for most or for many of these uh, NTMs in this category, we can't use, we can't calculate the ad valorem tariff equivalent. So what are governments trying to achieve through using these things? Well, one, one thing they might be trying to do is to correct a domestic market failure. And just to give an example, and this would be an example which the Australian government would regard as appropriate rather than inappropriate use of an NTM. Let's, let's suppose that food safety or some other credence characteristic of a food is important to consumers. By a credence characteristic, I mean a characteristic of the, of the product which is not known to the consumer at the point of consumption. So eating a rock melon contaminated with listeria is an example of a credence characteristic. So the f let's assume that the, 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 uh, the country is an importing country. The government has placed quality standards on domestic production, but imports are of lower quality. So if we assume to begin with, in the absence of government intervention, that consumers can't tell the difference, then they're going to reduce their consumption because they may be mixing low quality imported product with higher quality domestic product. It's a market failure. It's a market failure in that consumers don't have perfect information about what, what it is they're consuming. And the government can help to solve this problem by requiring imports to reach the higher domestic standard. In that case, if consumers know that both imports and domestic production are of the same high standard, then consumption will increase and so will imports. So the bottom line is that not all NTMs inhibit imports. A second reason, and the one that might be regarded as an inappropriate re reason, is the political economy reason where governments might want to support domestic producers. That is, in, the, uh, as in a protectionist way to try and increase their, their incomes. <clears throat> 
Let me turn very briefly to the topic of what happens to NTMs and preferential trade agreements. If the countries that form this agreement have different domestic standards, then one way to increase trade would be to harmonize the standards across, across countries. Alternatively, governments could, to, could agree that rather than harmonizing standards, they would regard each other's standards as being equivalent. And this is something that's in the SPS agreement, for example. I've already touched on this question of how are the trade effects to be measured, and I want to say nothing more about this except in the context of straight trading enterprises. So let me turn then to state trading enterprises. I want to do this in two, two parts. One, one is to give some background information on STEs, and the other is to provide an overview of the way in which we've tried to use economic analysis to answer the question that's posed on the title slide. State trading enterprises are market intermediaries. In GATT 1947, it was recognized that state trading enterprises existed, and Article 17 of GATT 1947 established the rules which STEs were supposed to follow. The difficulty was they didn't define what an STE was, which you would have thought would have been something they would have started doing. Let's decide what an STE is and then restrict what it does, but they didn't do that. We had to wait until GATT 1994 to find out what the WTO thought a state trading enterprise was. And this is the working definition from GATT 1994. Government and non-governmental enterprises, including marketing boards, which have been granted exclusive or special rights or privileges, including statutory or constitutional powers, in the exercise of which they influence through their purchases or sales the level or direction of imports or exports. So it's recognized that STEs may influence imp imports, they may influence exports, or in fact, some STEs do both. One aspect of STEs which is not well understood is this one. It is thought that ownership is the key. The government owns this thing. Turns out that's not the case. The distinction between an STE and a private profit maximizing firm, or a firm with commercial interests, is the nature of the special rights or privileges that the STE enjoys. That is, that is a fundamental, important point. Examples of STEs in, in agriculture, we've got Kofco in China, the Food Corporation of India, Bulog in Indonesia, what used to be called the Japan, Japan Food Agency, I've forgotten what GFPV stands for, and one in the Republic of, of, of Korea. These are STEs which operate to various extents in imports and, and exports. So STEs may be importers or exporters, they may or may, not, may or may not distort international trade. And I want to explore in a moment the, what we need to look at in order to answer that question, do they distort trade or do they not? In the, in the trade negotiations on agriculture that began in the WTO in early 2000, a common theme amongst the, the negotiators was that importing STEs inhibit trade and exporting STEs have an unfair advantage over private firms and therefore the STE should be subjected to greater discipline than that required under Article 17 of GATT 1994. Early on in the subsequent Doha round negotiations, importing STEs fell off the agenda and have not reappeared. So the focus at the moment is on exporting STEs, of which I don't want to say anything, because we're looking at STEs as a barrier to imports. So in, in what I want to say now, I'm going to deal exclusively with importing STEs. So that was by way of background of what, what an STE is. Let me say something about the analysis of STEs 
and try to answer the question. So rather than just take the mass classification and say STEs are anti-competitive, we need to be a bit more subtle and a bit more analytical in trying to evaluate what they do. So we need to dis de describe the characteristics of the market in which the STE functions. We need to de decide what the government's objective for it as an instrument of agri-food policy. We need to be able to do the analysis in the possible presence of other policy instruments such as minimum support prices to farmers. And we need to think about what would the structure of the market be if the STE didn't exist. Let me just go back over and explore these in a little bit more detail. So the characteristics of the market in which the STE functions. We're thinking here of an importing country. Does the STE have exclusive rights to import or not? Does it have exclusive rights to procure from domestic producers or not? Is the country a large country in international trade in the sense that if it changes its volume of imports, it affects the world price or not? So we need to be fairly clear about exactly what it is, the market structure in which the STE operates. We need to be clear on what the government's objective for the STE is. Is the STE there to transfer income to, to domestic producers? Or is it concerned with a, the STE trying to improve self-sufficiency in a particular commodity? Is it concerned with consumer welfare? Is it concerned with the STE's profits? Or is it concerned with overall social welfare for all the participants in that market? Let me skip the, the, the possible presence of other instruments. We also have to recognize that STEs are often accused of being inefficient relative to commercial firms. And this has been one of the criticisms of STEs that the World Bank and IMF have pursued over, over time. We can also, going back to the characteristics of the market, is the imported and the domestically produced commodity the same, or are these products differentiated? That complicates the analysis, but it really doesn't change the story a great deal. So let's consider an example. Let's suppose that we're dealing with an importing STE that is equally efficient as a private firm we're going to assume that the product is homogeneous in the sense that the consumer doesn't differentiate between the imported and the domestically produced product. We're going to assume that the STE has been given exclusive rights to domestic and import procurement and to domestic sales. Okay, so there, is no, there are no private intermediaries in this market for the moment. We're going to assume that the government has, has said that you have to maximize profits. Is that... Two minutes or five? Two minutes, right. Gallop on. Right. So, if we, have, if we have a bunch of equations, which I won't bore you with, we can calculate what the STE will import. It imports Q super script STE. And it procures from domestic farmers. Let's assume that the counterfactual is a monopsony monopoly. That is a single private profit maximizing firm that buys from domestic farmers and from imports and sells to domestic consumers. It will produce or procure rather an amount Q, Q pre. So the question, to answer the question on the title slide, how can we compare these two numbers? Because that's what we need to do in order to establish is the STE, a barrier to trade, because if we find out that, that QSTE is less than QPROV, then the, the STE is a barrier to trade. So let's think about how can we go through this without getting algebraic about it. Let's suppose that the STE is, as I've described it here, it imports the amount QSTE. It's a profit maximizer. Suppose instead we have a counterfactual. Should these two quantities be different? 
Well, no, the, the answer is no, they're not going to be different because the market structure is the same. One firm that buys and sells, their objective function is the same, their profit maximizers. So in this case, the STE is not a barrier to trade. Let's change the assumption. Suppose the government says to the STE, you must look after domestic farmers. The STE will therefore buy more from domestic farmers and raise the price that they procure at. By buying more from domestic farmers, they will decrease imports. In that case, the STE is acting as a barrier to trade because the objective that is given to it by government forces it to buy more from domestic producers and therefore import less. Suppose we change the assumption further. Suppose we say that the government has said, you must look after domestic consumers. We're concerned with, with uh, perhaps food security. If the STE is forced to, to buy more in order to keep producer prices, sorry, to keep consumer prices down, then it will buy more from domestic farmers and it will import more than this profit might say mising counterfactual, in which case the, this STE, in fact, enhances imports rather than decreasing them. So fundamentally, what we need to do is to solve this equation. The, the quantity on the right-hand side depends, as I've, I hope I've shown you, on what we assume about the state trading enterprise. What happens on the left-hand side actually depends on the number of firms in the counterfactual. It may not be a monopoly, monopsony, it may be something else. So let me just canter through this very quickly. I want to illustrate what I've been saying by looking at Bullock. There are three periods here I want to look at. One is pre-1998. Bullock had exclusive rights to import. It competed in the domestic procurement market with private firms. And it had a policy bias that was really not a bias at all. It was supposed to be neutral with respect to producers and consumers. In the following period, Bullock had no exclusive rights in either procurement market, and its bias was to, towards rice farmers. Private firms that imported faced a tariff which, they, which Bullock didn't, and in the post-2004 period, Bullock regained its exclusive rights, but it had to pursue commercial considerations. In other words, it had to be more of a profit maximizer. What effect did that have? What, what it shows is that in the pre-1998 period, Bullock actually acted as an import subsidy and not a tariff because it was pursuing consumer interests as well as, as producer interests. If you like, it was, it was fulfilling the role that perfectly competitive markets might, might achieve given its objective function. In the second period, it was forced to, to pursue a greater emphasis on domestic Indonesian rice farmers, which meant that it was restricting imports. And in the final period, where it was pursuing more commercial interests, it became even more of an import barrier. So these results are, in a way, consistent with the story that I told a couple of slides ago. So in conclusion, Exports of uh, agri-food products are important to Australia's trade balance. NTMs that are correcting market failures may well enhance imports. If they're introduced for political economy reasons, they may well restrict imports. They're difficult to deal with because they are so diverse and often opaque. STEs can have an ad valorem tariff equivalent, which is what I've Trying, trying to show how we can calculate those. But in order to say anything about is the STE an inhibitor to trade, we have to make specific assumptions. And unless we make these assumptions, we can't say anything. And a lot of the, uh, the previous discussion in the literature on STEs has not been analytical. It's been merely descriptive, which has not helped answer the question, are they a barrier or under what conditions are they a barrier? So that's what I've tried to do quickly in, the, in this paper. And the last takeaway message is that importing single desk, importing STEs, may be pro-competitive. Depends on what the government is trying to achieve. 
It depends on the counterfactual. It depends on a whole host of other issues. So they may be pro-competitive, but they needn't be. Thank you very much. <laughs>